welcome everyone uh, to our Lunch, Learn, Link seminar. I'm Norma Kanarak, Director of the Maryland Cigarette Restitution Fund Research Grant here at Johns Hopkins. One of our activities is to manage a seminar series that introduces people to various topics in cancer prevention and control, especially. And um, from time to time, I'd like to bring um, uh, pancreas cancer into the picture because uh, it's an important um, uh, contributor to, to cancer mortality, not only in Maryland, but across the country. And we um, are still learning uh, about what it is that causes pancreas cancer. So, so, um, sorry. Very embarrassing, so sorry. Um, so anyway, uh, we, ha we uh, do these uh, seminars uh, a couple times a month, uh, always on Thursday or almost always on Thursday at noon. Frequently we have pizza, today we do not. So I encourage you to come back and have uh, some light refreshments with us. But today, as I mentioned, uh, we um, bring in uh, pancreas cancer from time to time, and really our resident expert here at Johns Hopkins and from the Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center is Dr. Allison Klein. She's a graduate of both the biostatistics and the epi department here in the School of Public Health and is professor of oncology and pathology. She is the PI for the SPORE grant, the specialized research um, outcomes um, in research excellence project for uh, GI cancer and also is the co-PI for the National Pangreas Fam Family Registry. So um, she's going to basically bring us up to date on what is known now about pangreas cancer and, and its application to um, patient care ultimately. So I, let's welcome Allison. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to see. Hopefully, this works and I'm doing it right. Um, it's great to be here. I noticed as I was standing here that um, my talk's on inherited risk, and I will get there. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more um, just about pancreas cancer, its epidemiology, um, as well as some recent trends worldwide. So, for those of you who don't think about the pancreas all the time, um, it is an internal organ, um, with the head of the pancreas being by the um, the duodenum and the stomach and the tail reaching back into the spleen. Um, the nature of this organ, that it's an internal organ, um, you know, plays a role in our inability to catch pancreatic cancers until they're um, more advanced. You know, you can't feel a lump like you can with a breast cancer, um, per se. Um, also, you know, it's not an, an easily accessible organ, um, as we see with uh, colon screening and colonoscopy. Um, so the pancreas itself has two primary functions, both an endocrine function, um, controlling hormones, blood sugar regulation, as well as an exocrine function, which makes the digestive enzymes. Most pancreatic cancers, more than 95%, occur in this exocrine portion of the pancreas. So when, my talk, when I'm talking today, I really mean exocrine pancreas cancer for the most part. For the risk factors, they're very different um, disease biologically. Endocrine pancreas cancer is more rare, has a much better prognosis, is far more treatable um, than exocrine pancreas cancer, which comprises the majority of um, cancers that we hear about. Um, so. As of right now, it is the third leading cause of cancer death in the United States. Um, it's attributed to about uh, 56,000 new diagnoses projected in 2019. Um, the mortality of pancreas cancer is the poorest of any major tumor type. Um, it has about five or 10 years ago, the five-year mortality was 5%. Now it's 9%. So, you know, still very poor prognosis, but considerable strides have been made in the past um, decade. Um, you can see this kind of trend with decade, both in terms of incidence and mortality. And you see we've made huge strides against lung cancer, smoking cessation, colonos uh, both breast cancer and colon cancer for screening, 
Um, but pancreas cancer, you kind of see this steady kind of trend right here, and it hasn't really changed much in terms of um, the population since um, uh, the 1970s. Um, and actually, the risk of pancreas cancer and liver cancers, unlike many cancers in the US, the risk of these cancers are increasing. Um, and these are age-adjusted incidence rates, so not just overall incidence. So I'm going to touch briefly on risk factors and then talk about how these have kind of impacted global trends. So the most well-established risk factor for pancreas cancer is cigarette smoking. It approximately doubles risk in current smokers. Risk in former smokers is lower, and it decreases with time since quitting, such that but, you know, between 10 and 15 years after quitting, risk returns to that of approximately a never smoker. Obesity is kind of an increasingly um, recognized risk factor for pancreas cancer. It has about a 30-fold increased risk, particularly for the highest BMI categories to the lowest BMI cal categories. So individually, not a very strong risk factor, but um, at a population, it's very um, significant. Um, heavy alcohol use um, is also associated with pancreas cancer risk. Um, I was at a meeting yesterday, and we were de debating this. It's somewhere between at least three, but possibly up to six drinks a day is where risk really starts to take off. So it's not just you know a glass of wine a couple of days a week. It's really kind of chronic heavy alcohol use. It has about a 60-fold increased risk of disease. Diabetes has a very complicated relationship with pancreas cancer. Long-standing diabetes is a very well-established risk factor for pancreas cancer, up to about two years. New onset diabetes um, has found probably within the past decade or so to also be a risk factor or maybe an early symptom of the disease with about 8% of new onset diabetics, so newly diagnosed diabetics, having diabetes probably due to their pancreas cancer, so it's called type um, 3C diabetes um, versus kind of more traditional type 2 diabetes. This is an increasing focus for maybe an opportunity for early detection, um, but again, further refinement needs to be needed. Um, what I study in my interest is family history and genetics. Um, having one family member approximately doubles pancreas cancer risk. Having multiple family members increases risk about sevenfold. Um, increasingly, um, pancreatic cysts are a recognized risk factor for pancreas cancer. Again, this is something we see a lot more of than we used to. Why? People are getting CAT scans a lot more often than they did 10 or 15 years ago. If you do a CAT scan, 2% of the population who undergoes a CAT scan for any reason is found to have a pancreas cyst. Most of these do not transform into pancreas cancer, but a subset of them do. Um, a subset have malignant potential, and then some of them kind of differentiating between those that are likely to become a cancer soon versus that those that are likely to just need monitored or maintain a benign course is a very active area of research here. Anne-Marie Lennon um, runs an ongoing pancreatic cyst clinic and is really uh, looking within our GI spore program along with Bert Vogelstein. Um, and Nick Papadopoulos of ways of differentiating cyst types to identify those that require resection versus those that can kind of um, have a benign course. Um, <clears throat> however, I'm not going to talk a, a little that much about it today. Um, pancreatitis um, is another risk factor for pancreas cancer. Long-standing chronic pancreatitis has a two to fold increased risk. Again, like diabetes, is we see a lot of patients come in who report a recent history of pancreatitis. Um, they might have had pancreatitis due to a pancreatic cancer, and it just takes a while from that initial stage to get their diagnosis. One of the challenges um, with pancreas cancer, these risk factors are pretty general. The signs and symptoms of the disease, back pain, um, maybe kind of a diabetes are very common in the population, particularly in older individuals. We do see late stage disease often associated with jaundice, but again, jaundice doesn't really develop until there's a larger cancer that blocks the bile duct. So one of the reasons for the really poor prognosis is that most cancers have metastasized by the time of diagnosis. Um, and um, our treatments, once they get to that point, are not particularly effective. They're better than they were, hence that movement from 5% to 9%, but again, most of them um, are life-extending, not necessarily curative. 
So what are our global trends um, in pancreas cancer? Um, there was a really nice paper that came out this month um, in Lancet, oh, the reference is missing off of this one, um, in Lancet um, Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and they looked at pancreas cancer worldwide over the past 25 years. And what we've really seen, um, these red lines are, I want to say, um, about 1990 risk. Um, the blue lines are risk in 2000. Um, 2015, I believe, so 25 years, and they see um, overall increases in the age standardized um, incidence rates worldwide. So overall, the absolute numbers of pancreas cancers have really doubled in the past 25 years, um, and they go into a, um, some of the reasons for that that I'll touch on. So again, here is kind of the global map um, where we have the highest incidence countries and the lower incidence countries um, with um, you know, the United States, Canada um, in the middle, European in the middle. I'm not sure why Greenland's so high. Um, again, kind of smaller numbers, but again, lower rates in Africa. Um, one of the major reasons for this is it's not an easily diagnosable cancer. We didn't really, we saw kind of a, a, an increase in that first slide looking at trends in the US where we saw an upswing until about 1970 and then leveling off. It's not really a cancer you can diagnose. Um, without you know, access to imaging equipment, such as CAT scans. Um, so in developing nations, there's likely an undercounting of pancreas cancers. You know, people don't present, they present with metastatic disease, unknown origin of their cancer. Um, so we see a lot of it, you, know, you need to have resources to diagnose the primary site of the cancer is one reason. Um, and so this is kind of the global trends by countries um, over the past 25 years. You can see um, the United States and high income countries are up here where it's pretty flat, but there's a little bit of an increase in terms of kind of standardized um, death rates. In some areas of the world, you see a very sharp increase. And this is high income Asia Pacific. Um, so these areas with sharp increases are likely due to places that are able, that have had a major ability to change their diagnosis of it, from much harder diagnosis to be able to capture them more. So some of the sharp incidence is likely due to counting. Um, but there are kind of other major trends. You know, we do see an increase in the U.S. Um, we see an increase in Southern Latin America as well as other nations. Um, so why is this? The, Overall doubling is mostly due to um, advancing age. So in 2012, so not that long ago, 8% of the world population was uh, to be less than age 65, um, or sorry, greater than age 65. No, that's correct. In 2015, so for three years, um, it moved from 8 to 8.5%. Um, by 2050, again, it's going to jump to over. 16% um, of the world's population is over the age of 65. Um, pancreatic cancer is a disease that occurs late in life. Median age of onset in the U.S. is age 70. Um, lifetime risk in the U.S. To, to age 70 is about a half a percent. In that 15-year period from age 70 to 75, it goes from half a percent to one and a half percent. So the bulk of the cases and the incidence occurs in individuals in their sixth, seventh, and eighth decade of life. Um, even more so in the 7th and 8th. So as the global population increases in age, we're just going to see a lot more of it um, as well. Um, improved diagnosis is also a region um, for the increasing, but there are increases in the age-adjusted rates. Um, I pick up my formatting issues. Increasing obesity is a factor. The prevalence of obesity has tripled since 1975. Um, rates of alcohol and diabetes have doubled worldwide since um, as well. While smoking has decreased in some regions, so in the U.S., we see the proportion of pancreas cancers attributable to smoking decreasing while obesity um, increases. But in other areas of the world, particularly Asia, smoking rates remain quite high. Um, so what are the challenges to screening and detection for pancreas cancer? And one of the reasons I study genetic risk factors is maybe if we can identify high-risk individuals, they can be the first to benefit from screening. Um, so again, the challenge is pancreas cancer is rare. So these are my 200 people. Um, if we take 200 US whites at age 65, 
and looked forward 10 years, one of them will have developed pancreas cancer. So it's still very rare. Um, you know, if we look at standard risk factors, well, maybe we can use risk factors to define high risk groups, right? Um, if we take 200 current US smokers who are age 75, what happens? We move from, we now have two if we follow them for 10 years for pancreas cancer. So again, you know, if you think of the performance that you would need from a diagnostic, uh, a screening test, um, you know, it's still a very rare disease, a small number, and it's a rapidly progressing cancer. So the instantaneous probability, if you capture someone in the population that they have an, even an early cancer is really small. Um, so in some respects, um, modeling of breast cancer is different. Uh, if we think of kind of a population um, parameters, you know, if you think of sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value, those um, depends on kind of the prevalence in the population. Breast cancer is far more prevalent. Um, you have 200 US white women who are age 65. 10 years later, eight of them will have developed breast cancer. If you look at things that double risk factors, then you move from up to, you know, from eight to 16. That's a very measurable difference. Um, so again, as you look at screening and detection, balancing true and false positives of screening tests, it's, a very, it's much harder and you might need um, much higher specif uh, specificity when you move to a rare disease. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the challenge with pancreas cancer too is it's not um, something that's easily accessible. Um, so with um, colonoscopy, your screening, your detection test can also find early adenomas. It's removable, it's a common procedure. Um, for pancreas cancer, someone has a suspected um, even a pancreas cyst that has high malignant potential, maybe you've caught a precursor. The option then is surgical resection of the pancreas, which when done at the best centers has a 2% mortality rate. So it's not only a rare disease and the difficulty in detecting, it's kind of the consequences of that detection. And so you really need to be certain that what you're removing is likely to become a cancer when um, you know, the consequences of operating in that situation also has um, definite morbidity and mortality. So those were just the mortality rates I was quoting, where you think of, you know, side effects of colonoscopy, we often overlook them um, as well. Um, so again, you know, moving people to lower risk groups, what does this mean for breast cancer? Well, if you, you know, if you say someone has half the risk of someone having breast cancer, that moves it to four um, breast cancers in 200 people. So if you, you have a kind of a modest risk factor, you know, a two-fold doubling or a one-half decrease, this is a big change in terms of the absolute numbers, whereas if you applied those same to pancreatic cancer, it's a much smaller um, window of absolute number of cases um, if we think at the population. So I'm interested in studying um, genetic susceptibility to pancreas cancer. Um, so it, with the goal of this can aid in the earlier detection and um, help with targeted therapy. Um, so familial pancreas cancer, um, which is we define as a family where there's two close relatives with disease, so a parent and a child or two siblings with pancreatic cancer. It is an imperfect definition, um, but you need to draw a line somewhere. Um, it's much less of a threshold than when you consider things like familial breast and ovarian cancer, which typically have three relatives, or a young onset case, um, or breast and ovarian cancer um, as well, in part because of the rarity of pancreas cancer, uh, an individual having a second relative is quite remarkable, where given the prevalence of breast cancer um, and just family size, it's still um, significant having that family history, but it's not as quite as unusual um, and can happen more due to chance. So, um, so familial pancreas cancer, this pair of first degree relatives, um, unaffected members of those families have about a sevenfold increased risk, and this risk increases with the number of family members. Um, so I run a family-based registry here at Hopkins, um, and one of the reasons, you know, I'm a genetic epidemiologist by training, so we love family studies, um, but they're really, I think useful for diseases, particularly rare 
or diseases such as pancreas cancer, because what this really is is essentially a cohort of at-risk relatives that we follow prospectively. Um, and we can do DNA-based studies for gene discovery, gene environment interaction. Also, once you identify a susceptibility genes, there's still a whole host of questions that patients who have that mutation really need to make informed decision making, um, such as what is risk by particular ages um, to kind of warrant the risk benefit of screening or preventative strategies. Um, you can also learn a lot just based on family history. Oftentimes, when we do genetic risk assessment, it's based on family history. Um, so really understanding what is the risk based on all of these information. Um, so as of, I guess, a month and a half ago now, this is our registry here. So it was started back in 1994. We recruit patients who come to Johns Hopkins for care of their pancreas cancer. Um, Johns Hopkins sees more patients with pancreas cancer than any other institution, both um, because of kind of expertise in surgery, but we have a lot of... Um, wonderful medical oncology trials and really trying to move that forward as well. So for those two reasons, patients, because of our expertise, are referred here and come here for their treatment. Um, so we have just over um, 7,500 families. Um, most of these are defined as non-familial kindreds, um, over 2,000 of which are familial kindreds, which have two close relatives. Um, I meant to add that we recruit patients who come to Johns Hopkins, but we also get many patients referred to us through the internet through our very active website. Also, because we've been along for a long time, people who see unusual families often refer them to us as well. So unlike um, the many kind of high-risk family registries we're used to seeing three, four, or five affected, most of our families still have two. Um, we do have a handful with three, four, or more families. The challenge with these from kind of a gene discovery genetics perspective is, you know, oftentimes when we learn about the second case in the family, the first case is deceased and we can't get a DNA or a blood sample on it, on them. Um, and so then we're, it becomes more challenging to study when we want to look at things like co-segregation. Um, so it's really kind of the patients who drive this. We do have a handful of families where we have two blood samples on two affected patients um, as well. Um, we follow these families into the future, um, where in so sense we um, contact our families annually. They um, send back newsletters. Unfortunately, um, we see a remarkable um, higher risk of pancreas cancer in these unaffected relatives. So we've had, um, unfortunately, 309 individuals who were healthy um, when the family enrolled in our registry, but enrolled because a close family member had pancreas cancer, who've unfortunately gone on to develop disease themselves. The vast majority of these are in relatives, although a handful in spouses. Um, spouses stepping back to a certain extent, it makes sense. Shared environmental risk factors. Um, smokers are more likely to be married to smokers. Um, you know, BMI tends to be correlated. Alcohol use tends to be correlated. Um, so again, it's not surprising that we see a higher risk in spouses who are genetically unrelated but have these shared risk factors um, as well. So when we looked, um, and this is uh, from several years ago. So our numbers were much smaller, our confidence intervals are much bigger, but we see having one close relative has about a two-fold increased risk. Familial, as I said, is about a seven-fold increased risk, and then multiple family members, um, three or more, is a 17-fold increased risk. We found that age of onset of that initial case was important in, the, in, the, in prediction risk in our familial cases, but not so much in those lacking a family history. We also looked at um, excess risk of excess pancreatic cancers, and I think this was actually a study from many years ago funded by the Cigarette Restitution Fund, um, So, uh, or the student working with me was. Um, so we looked at both family history of both, um, so whether a family was familial or sporadic or non-familial, and looked at the relatives, and we found that overall, um, the risk of extra pancreas cancers was elevated in both groups, so a 50% increased risk in the relatives of those with sporadic pancreatic cancer and 40% increased risk in the familial group, and also the youngest um, age of onset of pancreas cancer in that family, so families with a case below the age of 50 also had a 50% increased risk. 
We then looked at um, risk of mortality um, for various cancers um, based on these family history categories, and we saw an excess of breast and ovarian cancer mortality, um, bile duct uh, mortality, as well as for the young onset group, an excess of colon cancer and prostate cancer. Um, so why is this useful for um, pancreas cancer risk modeling? Again, we have our 200 people. Well, getting us to a number of seven, you know, maybe this is a, a, a point where we can start um, having actionable. Um, we also know um, genetics plays a role. We have several known genetic risk factors that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but individuals with a BRCA2 mutation have an increased risk of pancreas cancer. Again, um, their risk is lower than just a straight family history. But again, you know, we have um, six cases in our 200 people. So we can identify high-risk groups both based on family history um, and also genetic mutation status. And those are, while those are correlated and someone with a family history is about twice as likely to have an identifiable mutation, there's many mut families that have an aggregation of cancer where we're still looking for the genes, and also many families with a susceptibility gene who don't necessarily report a family history, likely because even amongst um, individuals with a mutation, the lifetime risk is still, or the penetrance, as we call it, is probably lower than many susceptibility genes. It's also age-related, so we still don't see um, particularly young onset cases often in our high-risk families or in our mutation carrier families. Um, the best data out there suggests that maybe um, individuals with a genetic mutation or with a strong family history may get disease on average um, about six years younger than the general population, so versus early 70s, late 60s. So again, um, it's still a disease of later in life, even in these high-risk families. Um, so what do we know about um, BRCA2 in pancreas cancer? Um, BRCA2 is probably the most common mutation we see in families, probably about 2 to 3%. Um, if you have three relatives with pancreas cancer, there's about a 17% uh, chance you have a mutation. If you have um, from a moderate risk family, it's about 6%. Again, if you don't have any family history, it's probably closer to about 3%. This, these numbers also move around a lot depending upon where the study is and the percentage of the population that's Ashkenazi Jewish. Um, background rates of, Ash of um, BRCA2 mutations is about 1% in Ashkenazi Jews. Um, it is about 100-fold lower in the general Caucasian population. So again, um, these numbers are very sensitive to those estimates. Um, the 17% was from a study here that had a large um, Jewish population, so it's probably on the upper end of the spectrum. Um, Again, it's not limited to those. About 5 to 7% um, of patients with sporadic pancreas cancer um, reported um, were found, found to have BRCA2 mutations. This was a study of the cancers here um, from Johns Hopkins back in 1997, where we saw Baltimore also had a larger Jewish population then than it uh, does now. Um, so again, about 4.1% of Ashkenazi Jewish pancreas cancer patients have the 6174 Delta, which is an Ashkenazi Jewish founder mutation in BRCA2. Um, the role BRCA1 is also thought to increase risk. Again, this is probably lower um, than what we see for um, BRCA2. Um, it's about one to fourfold. Um, we did a LARS series uh, many years ago of about 66 patients. We didn't see any mutations. Um, larger studies have found that about 1.3% th of unselected Jewish pancreas cancer patients had BRCA1 mutations um, as well. And their overall lifetime risk of pancreas cancer was thought to be, um, while higher than the general population, still about twofold um, increased. Um, also common are uh, mutations in the P16 gene, which is commonly associated with familial melanoma. Pancreas cancer is the second most common cause of cancer in these families. They have about a 17-fold lifetime risk of pancreas cancer and comprise about 1% of families. Lynch syndrome, um, so or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, um, has also been shown with an increased risk, again, with a life to, uh, about an eight-fold risk um, in mutation carriers of pancreatic cancer. Um, switching from kind of classic 
uh, cancer susceptibility genes, um, as I mentioned, chronic pancreatitis doubled risk. There are individuals who are born with um, hereditary pancreatitis. Um, one gene involved is particularly PRSS1, um, which um, uh, functions and there's kind of degradation of the pancreas um, as well. 40% of patients with hereditary pancreatitis will develop pancreas cancer in their lifetime. Um, so again, kind of very, very rare in the population. Uh, many of these individuals have such severe pancreatitis that they have complete pancreatic insufficiency before they develop pancreas cancer. Um, they are also thought to be particularly sensitive to cigarette smoke, and that smoking decreases the age of onset of these families as well. Um, PALB2 is also a pancreas cancer susceptibility, so this was identified um, out of studies here in um, about um, 2009, where we did a whole genome sequencing of five familial pancreas cancer patients, one of which had a germline truncating variant um, in PALB2. Um, we then did a validation study, so this was um, whole exome sequencing. Three of 96 patients had additional truncating mutations. Um, subsequent studies have replicated this finding. We were probably very fortunate um, to have a frequency of one in five, because in the true population, it's probably about 1%. Um, so again, um, you know, we, you know um, we were fortunate that we were able to capture it in this set. Um, and we've done larger studies, um, which I will tell you about a, a bit more. Um, based on that success, we did a larger series of families. Um, again, 38 families where we looked at whole exome and whole genome sequencing. Two of the 38 kindreds had deleterious ATM mutations that was shared amongst affected relatives with pancreas cancer. In this study, we selected 38 families where we had multiple DNA samples on multiple affected so we could look at tracking. Um, we looked at 166 additional families and identified four more variants um, and none in controls, and subsequent studies have replicated this as well. Um, so one question um, that's really kind of, I would say, changed dramatically within the past four or five years is moving from germline testing for pancreas cancer based on very strong family history criteria to this idea that maybe this is something that we should be offering to new to all pancreatic cancer patients. Um, again, we had early studies um, from, 2000, uh, from 1997 showing that even unselected patients often carried, not often, but five to seven percent of the time had deleterious BRCA2 mutations. Um, you know, with changes in how, um, in the sequencing technology, um, overturning of patents with myriad genetics, more companies getting into the market, um, really expansion and lowering cost of sequencing through next generation sequencing, it's really changed the landscape. Whereas, you know, five or six years ago, tests were $3,000 a patient, now they're $250. Um, so, you know, it's both our increasing knowledge of genes, but also cost structure that's really changed that. Um, so again, in 97-98, um, 7% 7 of Hopkins surgical patients had BRCA2 mutations. In 2015, um, Steve Gallinger's group out of Toronto showed that this was about 4 6% of Toronto surgical patients. Um, we did a study, or Mike Goggins led um, a study in 2017, which showed that about 4% of patients um, on a panel test, so these are multiple hereditary genes, about 4% about had a bona fide uh, mutation, um, and a larger study out of Mayo, um, which I have a slide on in a minute, showed that it was about 5.5% of patients um, had mutations. So this is important, not just for the families and for risk, but also looking at um, therapies for the patients. So there's a recent trial, um, the POLO trial, that was published this year for pancreatic cancer specifically, where they looked at um, patients with BRCA deficiency, particularly BRCA2, and looked at PARP inhibitors. We know from breast cancer and ovarian cancer that these drugs are target um, BRCA deficiency and their inability to repair DNA. And um, this study showed um, an improvement in um, disease-free survival. Um, with PARP inhibitors. 
Um, we also know um, through studies here that checkpoint inhibitors are particularly um, potent in mismatch repair deficient cancers. Again, it's an infrequent number of pancreas cancers, maybe 1% or less, but they're particularly sensitive to um, these inhibitors. When, um, particularly for the PARP inhibitors, when these drugs work well, they work very well, and these patients go on to have um, extended survival, but not all of them do, um, maybe only about 20% respond. So again, the need to get better treatment. So based on these studies, um, the National uh, Cancer Center Compre guidelines were changed in um, late um, 2018 so that now genetic testing and germline genetic testing is recommended to be considered for all newly diagnosed pancreas cancer patients. Um, so I should have had this slide earlier. This is from the Mayo Clinic study, which also had odds ratios of pancreas cancer for the different genes. Um, PALB2 was in about 0.5% of cases. Um, ATM was in about 2.3. BRCA2 was in about 2%. So these are the most common mutations. And these other ones, um, MLH1 um, is a mismatch repair gene. So again, infrequent, but particularly important for those families. We do know that the majority of uh, familial pancreas cancer or all pancreas cancer is still um, yet to be explained, and that's where a lot of my current research is. Um, when we think of susceptibility genes, it's really a spectrum. It's not just high-risk genes or lowish genes. You, we have kind of an ongoing frequency. Um, this is kind of adapted from a slide um, from Terry Minolio, but you see it in most, all over the genetics literature, but this idea that rare um, alleles calling Mendelian disease, like the alleles found in BRCA2 um, or PALB2 or ATM, each of these particular uh, alleles or pathogenic variants are very rare in the population. You put them all together to get the 2.3% um, that you see in pancreas for ATM or BRCA2. Um, you also have kind of common variants, and these are identified through genome-wide association studies. So these variants are common in the population, you know, above 10%, but might only be associated with a 20% increased risk versus, you know, five-fold or higher. Um, but again, there's probably this middle ground here, and we're just kind of figuring out how to find those, um, both through our ability to get more genetic data on more people at lower costs, um, and also our ability to kind of interpret genetic data. Um, as well. So what are we doing for high-risk genes? Um, I mentioned our ATM studies and our PALB2 studies, and these were done through whole genome or whole exome sequencing. So we really wanted to say, well, but only a small number of families. So what happens if we do even more families? Um, so a couple of years ago, we did a large-scale study where we did whole genome sequencing of 638 uh, patients from 593 families. Um, and this was not just families from Johns Hopkins, but um, through our collaborators, both in Toronto at Mayo Clinic, um, Dana Farber, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, there are uh, Pittsburgh, so there were many sites that involved. So we brought all of um, the groups who had been studying familial ca pancreas cancer families and had registries and had them submit their best families for sequencing. Um, we really oversampled the best families. We wanted families with as many pancreatic cancers as we could, hence why. You know, we had 84 with four or more. If you remember back, that was a very small number, but we tried to get as many as we could on them. Um, most of them are Caucasian. Um, again, most of them are kind of diagnosed at older ages. We see kind of a slight increase in the 60 to 7 year olds uh, versus a, um, age 70 to 79. Why is that? We're selecting cases from hospitals that offer surgery for pancreas cancer patients. Generally, patients who come to surgery are younger and healthier. Um, so we do see lower um, age distribution. We did whole genome sequencing of germline DNA. Um, kind of here's the specs on our sequencing. Um, we looked for truncating variants because we knew these have a very powerful effect on a protein. You don't have functional protein when you have a truncating variant. Missense variants are much harder to interpret. Um, they're actual functional consequences. Um, and what we found was, um, out of all of the families, we looked for, um, counted up the number of um, truncating variants in a gene, 
um, in that individual. And what we found that by the number of genes, most genes, we saw one truncating variant in one person. Um, there were a couple where we saw two, and then a very, very small number beyond that. Um, when we looked bigger at those, um, ATM was at the top of the list. Um, we then see some other genes, TET2, uh, DNM, T3A. Um, this ended up being an artifact because at the same time, what, uh, we were doing this study, there was a whole literature that came out that as we age, we get somatic mutations that are clonally selected for in blood. Um, it's called clonal hematopoiesis, and these are genes associated with clonal hematopoiesis, and we were sequencing patients' blood. So it's a somatic event in blood of older individuals, um, not necessarily a pancreas cancer kind of driver mutation. Um, and we see a handful of other disease, some of which have known cancer function. But again, um, you know, proving that this is a major cause in these families is very hard. Um, we're continuing to work with these data um, as well. Um, when we looked at known hereditary cancer genes, so genes we know a little bit more about out of the 20,000 genes, again, um, most of them were hereditary genes, are known familial genes, uh, Fanconi anemia genes, BRCA is part of the Fanconi anemia pathway, um, and so other genes in that pathway as well as, uh, as, well as hereditary pancreatitis genes. Um, 58 of the 600 and, uh, or the 593 families had a deleterious variant and an established pancreas cancer susceptibility gene, so it was about 10%. This is probably a little bit low because if we knew a family had a BRCA2 mutation, we didn't sequence them, but we didn't require that family be, be pre-tested. Um, we found ATM in 20 families, so about 3.4%. Um, this is probably a fairly accurate number because when we did this study, ATM was not routinely tested for um, because that, in, um, that body of literature was still growing. Um, four patients had multiple deleterious variants. Um, interesting, again, um, it's a highly heterogeneous disease is what we found out. Most of the etiology remains un unchanged. So we are continually um, to explore these types of studies. In addition, we are looking at common variants um, as well um, through genome-wide association studies. In 2018, um, in collaboration with um, the PANSCAN and the PANC4 consortium, we published the largest um, GWAS study of pancreas cancer to date. Um, there was about 9,000 samples in our discovery um, phase and about 14,000 controls and we had about uh, 2,500 and 5,000 controls in our validation set. Um, this is redundant. Um, we looked at kind of our, so this um, is a Manhattan plot, which is by chromosome. It's the log inverse of the p-value. So the higher the tower, the more the statistical significance. Um, again, many of these very, very tall peaks were things identified in smaller genome-wide association studies, but still there's a fair number kind of right here, which was our new discoveries. Um, this is a quantile-quantile plot, uh, the expected chi-square distribution versus the observed. And what you see here is you want to see it along this kind of um, identity line, and that shows that there's reasonable control of type 1 error. Um, this tail um, up here is kind of the positive signals, but you want to see it following that. So it looks for an inflation in type 1 error, which can be due to confounding by ancestry or other reasons as well. Um, so these are our, our top hits to date. Um, Interesting, there's kind of clustering within particular functional pathways. Um, several of the hepatocyte growth factor genes are kind of cropping up. Um, again, kind of, you know, understanding the links between diabetes and pancreas cancer. Um, T53 um, is a known, um, is in the, uh, related to T53, P53, um, again, an important gene. And, um, the biggest, first biggest hit um, was ABO blood group, so individuals with non-O blood group have an increased risk. So here's kind of filling in that graph from before with our high-risk mutations and our lower-risk mutations. We have about um, 20 regions identified so far. Um, so again, um, future studies focusing on additional um, assessing of the rare variants, but also common variants as well. Um, 
We're also looking at kind of understanding overall what is the contribution of genetic factors to pancreas cancer. Um, Fei Chen, who was my doctoral student here who graduated a little um, over a year ago, was really looking at kind of what is the overall um, proportion of pancreas cancer that's due to genetics compared to the overall phenotypic uh, distribution of it. So this is traditionally what geneticists refer to as heritability. You can do this both during traditional family-based designs as well as population-based studies um, in unrelated individuals. Um, there is... Um, probably like less so within the past year, but again, this kind of dichotomy between what is the correct estimate. Is it these family-based estimates, which are what we traditionally were done doing twin studies, or these array-based estimates, which you um, can get heritability from unrelated individuals um, using kind of SNP array data to um, estimate genetic relatedness, and then look at the genetic relatedness in your cases and your controls to get an estimate of this heritability. Um, and what we did know was a little bit was due to these common GWAS variants at the time. Um, so you, she used an approach called genetic relationship matrix, which again is based on using these, um, the SNP array um, and the unrelated individuals to come up with an estimate of genetic relatedness. You can partition it based on um, minor allele frequency as well as linkage disequilibrium, which is the correlation between the markers. Um, we did this within the PANG4 GWAS studies, which is one of those um, within that meta-analysis I was telling you about earlier. And so what um, she found, and um, in theory, this um, LDMS, which is this um, linkage disequilibrium and minor allele stratified estimate of heritability, um, provided the, um, the most robust estimate. These other two methods were somewhat downwardly biased. Um, but again, about 20% of the variance of pancreas cancer, um, array-based estimate of pancreas cancer was due to um, a genetic factors. Was, um, again, and then we did genomic partitioning by chromosome. So looking at each chromosome, were they in, um, what was their overall proportion of heritability, and then um, what segment was it in? Kind of a common, uh, a rare variant, uh, um, where strong LD, a common variant with low LD. And this was just the distribution by chromosome. You could also uh, fractionate by minor allele. Um, so a lot of the um, unexplained heritability is in this rare variant space. Um, and then partitioning by functional groups. So is it encoding region, an intragenic, an intronic region? Um, and many, of, much of it was kind of in this intronic region, at least what we could estimate based on the chip. Um, one of the things we were interested in looking at, well, you know, does these array-based methods explain what we knew due to BRCA and other genes? If we took out those regions of the genome, um, what we found was um, that variation in this region only explained about a half a percent. Um, so either... Um, but one concern is that these methods, which are based on these arrays, which capture common genetic variants, don't really capture well this rare variant heritability. So that, that you know, it might capture some of this, this 21%, but maybe this kind of 36% is also due to these rare variants in families um, as well. Um, so what are our next state steps? We're doing ongoing analysis of our whole genome sequencing, doing focusing on missense variants, both rare variant and collapsing regions. We're also doing structural variant analysis. Within our, our GWAS consortium, we're doing um, gene by E analysis for smoking for diabetes. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about risk in non-Europeans. We also have an expanded GWAS study planned, um, which we're hoping to get funded, which will expand from our 10,000 cases to over 25. Um, hundred cases. So in the realm of GWAS, this is a really small number. In the realm of pancreas cancer, this is a huge number. Um, one of the things I'm particularly excited about is um, kind of the opportunity to study the genetics of pancreas cancer among individuals of African ancestry. So 10 or 15 years ago, um, we had thought about doing this. We'd even done kind of focused recruitment for pancreas cancer in African American populations. We sent, we took out advertisements um, 
and national magazines, we sent out brochures to churches. And I think we got one um, family through all of this. Simultaneously, we did focused recruitment on Ashkenazi Jews and got hundreds of families. Um, so we always kind of needed to do better um, studies. And we still need to um, figure out how to do better recruitment. But one of the challenges is, while African Americans have a higher incidence of pancreatic cancer, um, what we've really seen kind of in the US with the doubling, um, or globally with the doubling of the absolute numbers of pancreas cancer are also true for African Americans. Um, so in 2007, um, there were less than 4,000 cases a year diagnosed in the US. So uh, you know, particularly challenging, um, it has increased um, you know, to almost 6,000 um, in 2015. Again, continues to grow as the entire population um, ages. But not only are they at increased risk, there are also disparities in outcome. Um, median age is younger. Um, resection rates, so surgical detection of early stage disease, um, are comparable in blacks and whites. So the proportion that go to surgery is about the same. Outcomes after surgery are about the same. However, um, so um, blacks are more likely to have locally advanced disease, so disease is caught later. Survival is less and they're less likely to receive care at NCCN guidelines. Um, again, so while there is higher rates, there's disparities in outcomes. Um, it seems when disease is detected early and surgery is offered, they do as well. Um, however, it's getting, them, getting um, blacks and whites both high quality care. Um, for genetic studies, this matters, particularly because it's not always the same variance. Um, we know um, there's a, a large field now looking at calculating genetic risk scores from um, GWAS hits, and those have been shown not really to perform as well in um, non-white populations as Caucasian populations. Most of them were made in Caucasian populations. This can matter, you know, for a Mendelian disease, a truncating mutation in a BRCA2 likely has very similar effects. But when you get down to kind of um, GWAS variants, what you're often detecting um, is not always the co causative variant, but it could be correlated with a causative variant. Um, correlation structures in genetics vary across ancestry populations. So that what you might be measuring and detecting in a European study, which is correlated with the causative variant, it could be the same variant. Um, and the same causative variant might be captured by a different SNP in an African population, a different SNP in an Asian population um, as well. Or there could be different causative variants in different populations. We just don't know. Um, when, and this is kind of um, from a really, the previous slide and this one's from a really nice review article that came out in Cell this year, just looking at kind of the missing diversity in all genetic studies, not just pancreas cancer, um, but found that of the GWAS studies, um, in kind of the GWAS catalog, only a fraction of them had African populations. And when you looked at the actual number, so this is the number of studies, this is the number of individuals, only about 2% of those studies were in Africans. Um, so how do we move this forward? We have um, funding to do um, whole genome sequencing of 1,000 African American pancreas cancer patients and 1,000 controls, um, again, we have about 150 here. We brought together many cohorts and many case control studies. Everybody who we knew who might have even a handful of cases, we went to and asked them to contribute. Um, this is nested within our uh, GWAS consortium. Um, we have many cohorts represented, um, Amer cancer prevention study, the multi-ethnic cohort, um, women's health initiative. There are cohorts who aren't represented, and that's because they just didn't have enough cases for us. So it's not like we didn't invite everybody. And in inviting everybody, we got to 1,000. Um, so we're excited to kind of move this step forward. But I really see this as kind of the first step in addressing this. And we really need to do um, more future studies to both kind of understand the genetics of pancreas cancer in all populations. And again, um, all of this work is truly kind of team science. Um, my collaborators here at Johns Hopkins, um, Ralph Rubin, who started the registry um, in 94, Mike Goggins, who we've done a lot of the genetic studies with, 
um, Nick Roberts, who helped with the, um, the whole genome sequencing studies, Erica Childs and Evelina, who um, were my students with the, uh, the GWAS data. I didn't put Faye here. Faye did all of the heritability work. The high-risk families come from within our Pancreas Cancer Genetic Epidemiology Consortium. Our GWAS with the PANC4, we partner with the PANSCAN GWAS, run out of NCI um, with Leve um, as well. Um, happy to take any questions. hear you on the recording then, and so people who tune in later can catch your questions. Questions? Allison, I'll just start with mm -hmm. one um, about the BRCA2 uh, connection. Um, is there any thought about um, combining forces with the breast cancer folks about screening and... So, Right now, um, I didn't talk about the early detection trials for pancreas that are ongoing. They're mostly endoscopic imaging based. Um, right now, eligibility for those are individuals have to have a BRCA1 mutate, BRCA1 or BRCA2 or a handful of other mutations and have a relative with pancreas cancer. So we're not at the point where we're screening all BRCA um, carriers. We do have a Stand Up to Cancer grant right now that's looking at um, kind of not only this getting all pancreas cancer patients tested, but making sure that information cascades to the relatives and how to do that with kind of the expansion of genetic testing, and that's in collaboration with Dana-Farber. And in that case, any BRCA2 mutation carrier or someone who a relative of someone who has pancreas cancer and there's a BRCA mutation is suspected in the family, but that person hasn't been tested would be eligible for that study. Mm -hmm. um, and then it feeds into the other arms of the Stand Up to Cancer grant, which are a variety of early detection studies, blood-based markers, preventative vaccines, um, so all really interesting kind of early detection possibilities. Well, it, I'm pleased to see the movement into African Americans. I think that'll be very interesting. Mm -hmm. We're always interested in the subpopulations. I think we have a question over there. Hi. Going back to the question that you posed about um, testing at diagnosis now for right. pancreatic patients, mm -hmm. um, have you found, even though that's NCN, CCN guidelines now, do you find that patients, that that's happening in the community? Um, maybe so here, but uh, you know, just in the greater medical community. So I think it's getting there. Um, you know, it's so the guidelines changed about a year ago, and one of the driving factors. The first, the guidelines change, then insurance companies start paying for the test. Um, so I, I think there is a coinciding with it. There's just a lot more genetic testing of all cancers out there. You know, I think pancreas was one of the first to move into this concept of universal testing, but I think other cancers are going to get there. And there's also workflow issues in terms of having enough genetic counselors, what is the right size information, how do we kind of integrate this seamlessly into um, cancer patients, populations, and different institutions have different amounts of workflow. So I think it's very early in the stages. Um, we're really I'm really interested and have been working in kind of a variety of this to make it easier for the patients here to get tested, but also kind of bringing it beyond. Um, you know, different, you know, we work a lot in our test, our partners in one of the studies is with Dana-Farber, and they now have patients being set up if they want to see a genetic counselor on that first visit. That's not the way it worked here, but, you know, there's also the genetic testing kind of landscape is changing with not quite direct to consumer, but a lot more kind of streamlined testing. And really when, what is the best fit for pancreatic cancer patients, I think is an area we really need to develop a lot and figure out what is kind of the right amount of information. Is it upfront? Is it post counseling in the mutation carriers? How do you do this with the fact that this patient's really sick and facing a life limiting disease, I think is the challenge. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Uh, thanks for this. I'm not a specialist in this, but I do have two questions on this. <laughs> sure. You didn't mention anything on STK11, which I yes. thought I always learned a lot. So I came a bit late, so maybe I've missed that. That's one. Is there anything to tell about that? And also, is there 
a gene that links the primary cancer to the location in the pancreas, whether it's the caput or the so coda or... The, so SDK11 is a pancreas cancer susceptibility gene. Um, it is extremely rare in the population. It's, um, um, I, I think that's why I didn't mention it, but it, but it is, um, pancreatic cancer is very important in those families as well. Um, I think it was on one of the earlier slides. If not, it should have been. Um, but again, it's, it's extremely rare in the population. We don't see a lot of patients with that. And when we test pancreatic cancer patients, they rarely have a mutation in that without having um, the associated syndrome. Um, and, and so for germline um, mutations, not so much except for the, heredit the pancreatitis um, genes, I think it tends to be malignancies more specific to the pancreas. We do know kind of somatically that maybe not just with one somatic mutations, but clusters of somatic mutations might have more indication for um, specific tumor types. And um, with a lot of the um, circulating tumor DNA tests that are developing, some of those look for specific somatic driver mutations. And within those, based on the constellation of mutations, you can have a better idea of what the tissue of origin is. Um, they looked at that in kind of the development of cancer seek, where based on the mutations, the somatic mutations, not the germline, you can get a reasonable probability of where the primary tumor is. Mm -hmm. um, how often is, is tissue available to these patients, though? And is the somatic testing being done? It's 5 to 7 percent, is that an additional, but how often or does that happen? So, a lot of patients now are getting um, tumor testing at diagnosis as well. And so that's kind of the dichotomy between the germline testing and the tumor testing. Um, that's kind of more looking for both some of the targeted therapies we talked about, but kind of other probable targets as well. Um, so it's kind of, they're happening on very kind of separate um, pipelines right now for the most part. Oftentimes the patient, the places that do somatic testing will kind of hint that there might be a germline mutation there, but they don't firmly call it in their test results um, just because of the complexity. Allison, mm -hmm. thanks so much. You're I think welcome. we'll conclude for today, but do come up and talk with Allison if you have further questions. Let's thank her thank again. You.